Okay, I'd like to welcome Paul Dalton, the most successful coach for the Parramatta Rugby Union. Uh, we're in Taree. Uh, Paul's been retired for a number of years now and looking after greyhounds, and we're going to ask him about a, his football career and uh, some of his ideas and thoughts about, about rugby. So welcome, Paul, and thank you for allowing us to come into your, your home today. My and, pleasure. And, and I guess my first question is, can you just give us a background to where you started playing rugby and your thoughts about that and then where you moved moved from there so yeah well obviously it goes back a lot of years but um i played rugby at primary school and was always interested in rugby union and rugby league and then i went to boarding school and played first grade for chevalier college and uh, on leaving chevalier i went to eastern suburbs which was very handy to where i lived and got involved in their cults and uh, it was there I sustained a fairly severe knee uh, injury and that's what led me into coaching. So when you were at uh, Chevalier, you were captain? Of, of, of no, I wasn't captain. I was just a member of a very good football team. So any successful people from that team that went on to higher levels? or? No, no, not really, but there were some very good players in it, all, um, all boys from all parts of the uh, New South Wales, being a country school. So then you went to East after that, and that's yeah. that's where you grew up. In, I grew up at, grew up in the eastern suburbs, and I went to um, to East Colts, and they were called uh, the Wallaroos in those days. Well, we okay. um, had some very good players. They all came from GPS schools or CAS schools, but um, probably the standout was Paul Darbanese, and he was our hooker, and he went on and played for Australia, and is now a, a leading. Doctor, I'm not too sure uh, what he specialises in, but he's he's right up there as one of the best. And then from there, sustaining a knee injury. So was that in a tackle or? Yes, or I that? remember it very very well. It was uh, a game for Eastern Suburbs fourth grade against Randwick fourth grade, which is a traditional bloodbath. And um, I got in the middle of a ruck and got twisted, and I heard it crack, and that was, that was the end of it. And uh, if you can put the camera on it. Uh, many years later, there's the result. So you had a good turn of speed? Played breakaway? I played breakaway. I wouldn't say good turn of speed, but um, Johnny Cox, who was a prolific goal kicker for East and went on and played for New South Wales, he used to call me the mechanical man. So <laughs> I'd, I'd go for 80 minutes. Um, and so from there, you ca you took on a coaching position with East itself? Yeah, I did. Yeah, um, I guess football... Football was in my blood through my grandfather and my father, uh, although they were league people. Football was certainly in my blood. And I'm not too sure why, but I had an ambition to coach. I had no experience. So um, knowing that my playing days were, were finished, I then uh, went on to coach, uh, I think, East in the under-16s was my first coaching foray and uh, progressed from there. And these Colts? And then into East uh, Colts, yeah. And you were quite successful with that team too, apparently. Yes, that was the first year that um, the Colts came into uh, into play, so to speak. And uh, Hornsby were in that year, and I think there was one other, Liverpool, or there was one other uh, team outside the, uh, the teams today. And uh, no, we were lucky enough to win it in its first year, so uh, that kicked me off to a good start. So... Before they ran out for the grand final, what, what did you say to the boys? You know, were you quiet or were you, you know, told them what they had to do? Probably in those days I was fairly quiet. <clears throat> I had some boy, well, I had some boys in the team that probably I was best to be quiet to because they were, you know, they were... They so were there, were, there were notable players that went on? Um, gee, you're testing my memory now. Um, in that year, uh, I don't think so, but... It, a couple of years later, yes, we had some New South Wales and Australian reps coming out of that Colts team. Okay, so that was in the first year. So then you got married, I take it, or? I was married then. Okay, and you live in the Eastern Suburbs and you moved to, to, moved to Dural? We moved out to Dural and we had a few kids from memory and uh, we bought our first home. What drove you to, to go to Parramatta or, you know, any? Well, I, I guess it was the closest club. Um, applied for the Colts and... Um, got the coaching job of, of the first grade Colts. And you've coached there for like the Colts for three years? I think it was three years, yeah. And, and would the most notable part be like the 19, what, 1975 grand final with, in Colts there, you took them to, to the grand final also? Yeah, we 
we did. We um, unfortunately got beaten by Manly, uh, but we had a very good side, and uh, a lot of those players uh, continued on and uh, were part of the 85-86 um, uh, grand finals that we that we had later. There'd be a number of Australian players in that cult side too, like Butch Walker and yeah, Mickey Butch Martin, Walker, Martin, Mickey Knight. Martin, Martin Knight, most definitely. Um, yeah, and then there would have been some New South Wales reps players as well. And from there, I guess your next stint was after Parramatta won in 77, you took over the, the, the mighty force with yeah, Bob Yeah, I, I, I progressed from the, uh, from the Colts into, into fourth grade and I was lucky enough to get a couple of um, uh, cast-offs from the higher grades and Will Rebilliard and, and Rod Batterham. <coughs> they were part of that team and we went on and, and won the grand final. Now, I know you're a, a, a disciplinarian. Um, did you stop uh, Rod uh, Batam having his smoke before a game and not warming up? No, I just, <laughs> I, I was pretty smart in those days, so I just let Rod do his own thing. <laughs> and Will Rebellion, he was, um, he was a great inspiration as well. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was one of the reasons I think uh, we won the 77 grand final and we went out and played his team out at the Hawkesbury College because they gave us a big wake up call, took yeah. us out, and we played a game against them. So from the fourth grade, um, you went on then, and then when when did you get your opportunity to take over first grade coaching? In 1983, I was fortunate to uh, to uh, win the first grade coaching position. So how did they go in that? You made the semi-finals that in the first We year? did. We made the semi-finals. Um, <clears throat> uh, we had some, I guess, some players coming from the uh, previous year, you know, like Kevin Elliott, Ray Elliott, Butch Walker, um, so I probably had some players at the end of their career, and um, yeah, you know, we, I was quite happy with our result. Yeah. And then '84, we went all the way, went all the way through the grand final. '84, yeah, we um, we were lucky enough to get uh, the young, well, the Colts from the previous few years to come through, like the Melroses, um, the Goddards, um, and so on, and uh, they made up a, a very formidable side. So can I just go back one step with that because I just I was thinking too, having talked to Frank Lawson, who was the you know, director yep. of football, uh, said you were the man that recommended Tony Marrows to, to be go great virtually from Colts to to grade to play first grade. So he thought you were a very good person, a good person in actually identifying talent. Yes, I was. I I, I did do that, um, and <clears throat> without. Trying to be too big-headed, I think that was probably one of my best strengths as a coach, that I did recognise a footballer from a hockey player, so to speak, yeah. and that always, um, you know, um, sort of looked after itself. Okay. And then the 84 side again, because that was an interesting interesting um, team too, because I know it was a team of midgets having played in it myself, that you, you came with some innovative, innovative moves with the short line-outs and things that we weren't supposed to kick the ball out because uh, we didn't want them to throw the ball in, so we had to keep the ball in hand, a few of those things. So have you always been a good tactician, or is that just something for, as a player that I thought that you had, you're fairly astute in, 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 uh, as, in organising game plans for, for the opposition? So is that something nah, you worked on? Or? Nah, that was something that I worked on very, very uh, extensively. Um, hours, I've got to be honest. Um, all through the week, I'd look at and analyse the opposition. I'd know what we had or know what our capabilities were and our strengths and weaknesses. And, um, yeah, I just devised, I guess, moves and plans that would uh, give us the edge. And Because um, we were a small team, very small team. Well, I remember playing down at Manly Oval, and I'm 190 centimetres, and I was the tallest person in Parramatta and the shortest person in the line against Manly. You know, yeah. Not the shortest um, person, but, yeah. I just had and I was the belief. jumper. I had the belief as a coach that I always picked the best footballer. Size didn't matter to me. I think if the guy had um, good ball skills and common sense and fitness and all those sorts of things, I'm always a great believer in the ball will beat the man. And that's how I sort of coach that um, we made the ball do the work. I know also in the 84 uh, grand final, the change room, after we'd lost, you would have thought we won. 
compared to Ramwick because the Ramwick had won it so many times before, but everybody was so ecstatic. I thought they realised that you know next year might be the year. The '84 side that led into into 1985, which is you know eventually winning the uh, grand final. Can you just take us through that year and your thoughts and how you felt and all the things that went with it to get them to the grand final? You know, in the second year again. Well, I, I think it was um, the next step after the '84 uh, where. We probably acquitted ourselves very well. Um, it was probably the last game the Ellis played for Randwick. We were in it till half time. Experience probably beat us in the second half. So we learned a lot from that. Um, so we took that into the 85 season, obviously with more confidence and more belief in ourselves. We built on that and we developed that. And uh, at the end of the day, we were a very formidable side, side that believed in themselves and um, very fit and just knew how to win. And that year you, you got the ABC Coach of the Year? I believe I did. <laughs> I won it a couple of times, actually. Um, but that year I think I actually got presented with the trophy, yes. Okay. And how did that feel? It's like the recognition of all the work that you'd done? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it, it felt good. Um, yeah, I must say. I was was it a black tie, tie dinner? Black tie dinner? I've never made it to any of those. If it was a black no, tie no, it wasn't. It was just something that was announced from memory and um, the uh, trophy somehow found its way to me, which I still have today. I guess the hardest part for any team, and I've listened to Jack Chips and things like that, is to back up again to keep... I know in the 77 side, the 79 couldn't... Uh, 78, they couldn't do it. But you actually had a team to back it up again. So that's three grand finals in three years. So what was the key to success in 86? Uh, in, in, in following through on, on, on the 85 grand final, which where you won by two points after Neil Cat kicked the goal? Well, I guess it, um, it was something that I always wanted to achieve. Uh, if I set myself something, I'm, I'm pretty tough on getting what I want to do. And I always remember, and I go back to rugby league with St George when they won those 10 premierships, and they were a mighty side. And I just think that that's the, mark, the makings or the markings of really what coaching and playing is all about. I think winning one premiership is great, but it's very easy then to lose your sight of the next step. You know, um, human nature says, gee, I've achieved it, and you can always come back the following year. And, and I wouldn't say lackadaisical, but that sort of uh, motivation is, is not as strong as it should be. So it was something that I believe that, if you're a good coach, you should win back-to-back. -back. And I think it is the coach that is more responsible than the players to win the back-to-back, -to, -back, to keep them focused, to keep them up there and keeping that will to win. So it was a big thing that I wanted to do in my life and I was lucky enough to achieve it and I'm very proud of it to this day. The 86 grand final, like Randwick was stacked with Australian players. Mm. I think Campisio was there. I mean, the scoreline, you put the sword to them. And it was, it, it was a really, I think, probably one of the best grand finals I've ever witnessed. Yes. Um, I mean, I think the first try was Timmy Callahan down the line. Like, so, it you know. was, with a little kick through, and he dived on the ball in the right-hand corner. I remember that. Yeah, look, I, I think Ramwick were the favourites. We, um, we were fairly strong through the year. Ramwick, I believe, were the minor premiers, if my memory serves me correctly. We had a bit of a slump prior to the semi-finals, but then we picked picked it up and we came into the uh, semi-finals fairly strong and obviously came into the grand final feeling, well, very confident. Uh, we had a plan. We believed they had a couple of weaknesses. One was David Knox. We certainly played to that and it worked out in our favour and um, it was a convincing win. And uh, it was just nice that no one from around we came into our dressing room at the end of the game. I thought that was brilliant. That even felt better. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny Maxwell would have loved it. The the interesting part too with, with, with all of that was that you in the times when you've coached too, you you were you you were, you were, you were always game enough to, to change your team about. It was never the old boys if it, if they weren't performing or whatever. I mean, I know in '84 I think you made about six changes at one particular time, shuffled them around and you know, made things. So has that always been your philosophy too? You know, like I say, you've always played the played the man. Like I know Peter Ferris was captain in what eighty eighty. Five and a tiny captain in, in 86. I don't know what the change, I was only a spectator then, so I don't know why that changed, but you were game to, not game was the word for it, made certain decisions about 
who's going to lead your team and who's going to be in your team at particular times? Yeah, well, that that um, particular point that you're talking about with Peter Ferris and Greg Melrose, uh, Peter Ferris was the captain and he was carrying a shoulder injury. And okay. I, I just felt that was affecting our, our line-out or his line-out throwing. And so coming into the grand final, I made a decision um, that I would drop Peter Ferris and put in Kel Black as the hooker and line-out thrower and Greg Melrose would be the captain. As it turned out, it was a master stroke. Um, I lost a good mate for a while in Peter Ferris. Uh, he was very disappointed, understandably. Um, I would like to think that um, we're back to where we were in the 85 uh, grand final. Uh, we still speak quite regularly, so, um, but I know he was very hurt. But, but uh, Kel Black was no slouch. I mean, Kel Black was no he slouch. Played, yes, I'm, I'm certain he's played New South Wales or something. He like did. That, he as did. A school boy. He played New South Wales when I actually coached New South Wales. So um, no, it was just a, it was the right decision for the right game. 